Welcome to Cove Presbyterian Church. Today I'm going to play movements two and three of Sonata Number no. Eight in C Minor, Opus 13, by Beethoven. This sonata, called Pathétique, is one of Beethoven's most popular piano sonatas, composed when he was 20, when he was only 27. His publisher gave it the title Grande Sonate Pathétique, which means passionate or emotional, and Beethoven agreed with that title. The second movement, which is marked Adagio Cantabile, which, which is a very slow tempo and in a singing way, um, is very calm with a beautiful melody. I got to know this piece very well when I used to listen to the radio program Adventures in Good Music, hosted by Carl Haas, which aired on public radio from 1970 to 2007. He was an excellent pianist and began every program with this piece, which he played himself live every time. I just found that out. Then came his trademark, Hello Everyone. He had a beautiful, deep, sonorous voice. The first movement is very dramatic and stormy, with a tinge of tragedy, but I'm going to begin with the second movement and follow it with the third, a rondo in a quick allegro tempo. Rondo is a form in which a musical theme stated at the beginning returns several times during the piece with different material interspersed, sort of like a club sandwich where the theme is the bread. I love playing this piece. It's like going on a little adventure.
Friends, welcome to Cove Presbyterian Church. I'm glad you've joined us for worship. I'll be preaching a sermon today called Last Lines That Linger, taken from the closing verses of the Gospel of Matthew and the last verses of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Listen now for the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Paul ends his second letter to the church in Corinth with these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May God bless these readings of God's holy word. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. So begins Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, so begins Pose the Raven. These are the times that try men's souls. Opens a series of essays by Thomas Paine. Shakespeare's opening lines, though, are among the most memorable. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, is the opening of Sonnet 18. If music be the food of love, play on, opens Twelfth Night. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York, opens Richard III. And who can forget the opening voices of the witches brewing trouble in Macbeth as they ask, when shall we meet thee again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? These are just a smattering of famous opening lines etched into our memories But what about closing lines, last lines? Do any of them linger? How many remember the last line of a tale of two cities, or the raven, or twelve nights? Not many. The conclusion seems inevitable. Last lines are simply not all that important, certainly not as memorable as opening lines. Well, the Apostle Paul and the author of Matthew's Gospel would disagree. Both authors were masters of crafting closing lines, lines that linger in the imagination long after the book, in this case, the Bible, was closed. The final scene in Matthew's Gospel happens atop a high mountain. The crucified and risen Jesus has returned to visit his disciples to this collection of flawed and sometimes failing disciples, Jesus announces that God has given him and through him them all authority on heaven and earth and sends them out as agents of God's promise and change. 
Then the curtain falls. The screen credits play. The book ends. Sadly, that is how some people hear the last line of Matthew's gospel. Wouldn't it be tragic if this gospel of grace ended on a note of law? Go out and do this, disciples. Get a move on, disciples. There's no time to waste. The future of the church depends on you, disciples. So get it right. In our feeble hands and bumbling theology, the great commission becomes the great burden. What pastor, what elder, what church member has not asked the question, am I doing enough? Because from a child, I have been taught that to be the church, we must be busy. Busy saving the world, saving the planet, saving the cosmos, busy raising enough money to show the world that we're a successful church, busy going on mission trips to help those less fortunate than we, busy signing up more members so we can show other churches that we are something special. Lord God, are we doing enough? God, forgive me when I have forgotten to read the last line of Matthew's gospel, when I have promoted such pious nonsense. For when you and I buy into the gospel of doing more and more and more, lest the church collapse beneath us, we forget the closing line in Scripture at our own peril when in Matthew's Gospel, the risen Jesus gathers a crowd together and says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. That is a last line that lingers, must linger. We are the church not because of our strategic plans, our holy busyness, our mission trips, our bulging budget, or our expanding membership role. We are the church because the risen Jesus and the living Spirit of God make it possible for us to be the church and to be the kind of church that actually matters in the world. Tom Boyd tells the story of a professor who lost his wife to an early death soon after his retirement. In a not too fine moment in his young career, his pastor told the professor, you know, the church is not a lonely hearts club. The professor who otherwise would have been much less confrontational responded, no, pastor, that's all the church is, a lonely hearts club. I come here because I am lonely for God, and I need to know that God has not abandoned me. Lo, I am with you always even to the close of the age. Without that last line, the great commission born in grace becomes the great burden born in guilt. The only sustaining way that you and I can risk being the church of Jesus Christ is to know that we are not on this journey alone because otherwise the journey is just too hard. The slain priest, Archbishop Oscar Romero, compared the church to a river that, quote, will meet a thousand obstacles just as a river encounters boulders, rocks, chasms, 
But just as a river flows on and prevails, so will the church because Christ is with us. Along with Matthew, the Apostle Paul was a master of last lines. Last lines that linger. Be honest now. Have you ever been watching your watch uh, around noon on Sunday? Or had your mind wander to that delicious afternoon meal ahead? Or that long winter's nap? When the pastor raised her hands and said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That last line was not a simply a lovely way for Paul to end a lovely letter. 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians for that matter, are not lovely letters. And if ever a church needed to hear that line, it was First Church Corinth. Just prior to these words, Paul sums up his advice to this cantankerous crowd of Christians with a list of imperatives, sounding more like the great burden. Paul insists, mend your ways, listen to my appeals, Agree with one another and live in peace. Then he raises his hands and says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I'm often shocked at the image people have of the church. To those on the outside, often the church is a bunch of Hopeless hypocrites or naive fools who will believe anything. Or stuff shirts who simply don't know how to have a good time. To those on the inside of the church, it's not nearly so easy to describe. Some come to church to mend wounds. Some come to find meeting for a life that is out of control. Some come because church feels like the closest thing to a place called home. Some come to church like the retired professor to know that they are not alone. And some come to church because they need to be in a community where Micah's words are never drowned out by other words, do justice. Love mercy and walk in humility with God. Not only do people come to church for a wide variety of reasons, a wide variety of people sit in church pews. Some are well traveled and some never travel outside the state. Some are, are of vast financial means and some struggle to sublet an apartment over in a garage. Some are educated at the finest universities and some are taught in the graduate school of hard living. It takes all sorts to make a church, right, C.S. Lewis? One fold doesn't mean one pool. Cultivated roses and daffodils are no more alike than wild roses and daffodils. How could Paul have ever expected such an unlikely alliance of people in Corinth with a vast variety of wants and needs to ever mend their differences, to rise above their differences to be the church? How can such odd assortments of human beings in every church since Corinth, including Cove, ever come together to do the work of the church? How can churches of every size and shape and composition look beyond what they need in order to be the church that the world so desperately needs? 
Those questions are answered best by the last two lines that have lingered from the birth of the church to this moment. Lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you do not remember the opening lines of Matthew's Gospel or Paul's letter to Corinth, for God's sake, for the world's sake, for your own sake, remember these closing lines, these last lines that linger, reminding us that we are the church not because of anything we do, but because of what the risen Jesus does in us. Because of God's comforting and agitating spirit, we can speak out for just mercy when others would have us hold our tongue. We can stand right beside those denied just mercy when it would be far safer to sit at home. And we can vote for those committed to creating just mercy when it would be easy to conclude that our vote doesn't matter. Every Sunday, this is the last line that I speak before the congregation leaves. Go into this world that God so loves and be makers of peace. I believe those words. But after this past week, sitting in my undeniable position of white privilege and watching a nation afire with racial rage, that last line I speak is simply not enough. Maybe the last line I need to speak is go into this world that God so loves and be makers of peace who demand just mercy for all sisters and brothers, who work for just mercy for all sisters and brothers, and who are not duped that just mercy can never happen for all sisters and brothers. The only way I can speak those words with one ounce of integrity, with one bit of conviction, is because I am counting on you to live into those words with me. And even more essential because I trust in this last line from Jesus. Lo, I am with you always. Even to the close of the age. And I hold dear to this last line from Paul, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
of all the words we read, of all the words we hear. May those be the last lines that linger. Amen.